you know that your brain is the center of learning. It, but you've never seen your brain. You can't feel it. It's invisible. It's the invisible foundation for everything you've ever learned. It's the center of your perception, memory, your thinking and feeling, your life experience. Uh, so what is it? Well, physically, it's three pounds in your skull. It's 2% of your body weight, but it requires it uses 20 to 30% of your food energy. Every time you eat, you're literally feeding your brain. Uh, it has 100 billion neurons, 100 trillion connections called synapses. That's where learning occurs. It's the most complex thing we know of in the universe. So anybody who tells you that, oh, I know how the brain works. No, we know just a little bit, but that's enough to help us teach and learn. So uh, here's an image of five mammalian brains. And ours is not the biggest. Ours has all of these convolutions. Uh, it looks wrinkled, uh, but a dolphin's brain is bigger and more wrinkled than ours. Uh, certainly a whale and an elephant have larger brains. Uh, the chimpanzee looks very similar to ours, a little smaller. And then uh, other mammals have fewer wrinkles. Uh, the rat has all the same components that we do, but uh, just not the complexity. The Egyptians, for example, tried so hard to prepare to preserve their dead people's bodies for an afterlife, uh, mummification, and they chose the four most important parts of organs to preserve in these canopic jars. Uh, one for the stomach, one intestines, lungs, liver. They threw the brain away because they didn't know what it did. Well, that's understandable because it has no moving parts or bones. No clear structure. It looks like a squishy mess. It's mostly water. What does it do? Maybe they thought that that was the body's reservoir of water. I don't know. How does it work? Well, only in the past hundred years uh, have uh, re researchers, scientists begun, just begun to figure out its mysteries. So uh, one of the, the simplest ways of thinking about it are with the three major domain, uh, major brain divisions. And from the bottom up, um, we can think that, okay, this part in red, a brain stem and what's called the cerebellum, is like the reptilian brain. Uh, all mammals, uh, birds, reptiles have this capability. Uh, it's the instinctive part of our brain where we do things without thinking about them. Uh, above that is in blue, what we might call the mammalian brain. All mammals have that and on top of their reptilian brains. That's our emotional center. Uh, also for uh, critical in memory, uh, it's called the limbic system. Uh, so far, all of this is unconscious though. Uh, to experience consciousness, we have to get into the new brain, the analytical brain. But our analysis, our planning, uh, our decision-making is clustered in the prefrontal cortex, the part behind your forehead uh, on the orange diagram. It's uh, uh, highlighted or, or uh, outlined in black. So your brain is an awful lot like an iceberg where you're only aware of maybe the top 10% or, or less. And most of it is invisible uh, for an iceberg below the, the surface of water, uh, for the brain below the surface of consciousness. Well, let's take a closer look at that tip of the iceberg, that part of the brain that has human consciousness in it, the cerebral cortex. That's the part that's the wrinkly surface of the brain. Uh, it's actually only about an eighth of an inch thick. It's the part between the red lines that you can see there. And it's all wrinkled because if it was stretched out, it wouldn't fit in your skull. Uh, so stretched out, it's about as big as a 17 inch dinner napkin. Uh, again, eighth of an inch thick. Uh, but that's your whole cerebral cortex. Your prefrontal cortex, the part that uh, in, in red here in little a uh, little image behind your forehead is the part where your planning and decision making happens, the part that you're most conscious of. And that part would be more like a nine inch napkin. Uh, but uh, some children are born with such a terrible brain uh, problem that, they're, that half of their brain, right or left, actually has to be completely removed for them to be able to live. If that happens before age six they can grow into perfectly normal uh, adults with full human brain functioning. In that case, that extreme case, their entire conscious part of the brain is only about as big as a six inch napkin. Again, an eighth of an inch thick. That's you, wow. 
Well, let's take a look at one of the parts that's unconscious. Uh, we know a lot about the vision system uh, compared to smell and hearing and that sort of thing. So let's look closely at that. In fact, most of what you ever learn comes from your vision. So this is a good thing to know more about. We all know that our eyeball has a lens in the front of it. Uh, what we see right side up in the real world enters our, our lens and is reversed so that it's upside down on the back of our eyeball, the retina. Uh, your retina has about one million uh, light sensitive neurons, rods and cones, uh, and they are, um, well, if you compare them with a, a modern camera like the camera in your cell phone, that might be 12 megapixels. Each eyeball is only one megapixel. How come everything looks so sharp to you? Well, because whenever you look at a certain thing, that, that part falls in the center of your eyeball, and that's where the light-sensitive neurons are so densely packed. So only about 2% of your retina is sharp, and only about 25% of it allows you to discriminate color. All the parts on the periphery are fuzzy and, and sort of grayscale. Uh, but you don't experience that. Uh, your retina and the, and the neurons behind it, they're actually part of your brain, figure out what's most important about what's changed in the scene to figure out. And so it sends about 10% of the information it has received over the optic nerve to uh, the visual cortex, uh, the part of your brain in the back of your head uh, that does all of the uh, image magic. Uh, there's no actual image that is displayed there. It's not like a movie screen or a, a phone screen. Uh, there's no place you can insert probes in your brain to figure out what are you seeing? What you see is an experience that is generated. It's constructed by your visual cortex. And it's good enough for you to take action on, uh, but it's not perfectly accurate. The parts that are fuzzy where you can't see the color, you don't sense that because your brain kind of knows what's there, what it expects and it sort of fills that in for you. Uh, so what your brain predicts really has a lot to do with what you and how you interpret what you see. We're gonna do a little task, a reading task. You'll be reading a paragraph, but it's a weird paragraph. And you'll find that it's your brain's ability to make accurate predictions that, that lets you read this paragraph very quickly. Ready? Three, two, one, read. Okay, how was that? I bet you could read it pretty smoothly, even though there are very few words that are spelled normally. Uh, and the last sentence says, well, that's because you read a whole word at a time, not letter by letter. The other half of the story is that your brain predicts what is reasonable to come next. Your brain insists on trying to make meaning out of everything it sees, no matter how confused it is. And you've seen how effective well, let's continue looking at the unconscious parts of our brain that are so critical, especially in learning. Uh, here in the limbic system, the mammalian brain, uh, that pink, what looks like a letter C, is the hippocampus. That's kind of the, me the memory manager of your brain. Uh, just above that, uh, a little almond-shaped item in, pur in light purple is the amygdala. You can think of that as your emotion sense center. Uh, the part in yellow, uh, below your visual cortex in the back of your brain. Uh, it's about, about the size of a large plum, but it holds 80% of your brain's neurons densely packed in there uh, to take care of the automatic and kind of procedural things that your body d does without you thinking about it. So obviously breathing, uh, your, your heartbeat, uh, even things like riding a bicycle or walking. Once you don't have to think about that anymore, uh, much of that is stored in the cerebellum. And uh, your body has a sensory manager where all the senses come together to make sense out of what you're experiencing. Uh, the somatosensory cortex, which goes kind of across the top of your head from ear to ear. Uh, the memory in your brain is super important because memory is almost the same as learning, right? If you learn something, that means it's in your memory. If you don't learn something, it's not in your memory. So 
Where does memory start in the brain? Well, it starts in the hippocampus where uh, your brain acquires uh, experience to figure out what is valuable, what does it think is valuable to store in memory. That information is prioritized by the emotion center, the amygdala where if, it, if there's an emotional content, that means it's important to your brain. It's important enough to save in long-term memory. Now, you have multiple kinds of memory. Uh, the shortest memory, uh, working memory, uh, happens in the uh, front of your brain, where you kind of shown by little yellow dots there. Uh, let's say you're, you're doing some mental arithmetic. You're just adding three numbers together, 2, 8, and 11. You hold them in your brain consciously at a time, right here. Uh, let's say you're trying to remember a phone number. Uh, you remember it right here between the time you see the phone number and you actually dial it. Uh, but for a memory that you really remember, that's long-term memory. How does that come? Where does that come from? Well, you have sort of short-term memory of things that happen to you during the day. And then at night during REM sleep, uh, your amygdala and hippocampus work together to figure out what happened today that's important to put into long-term memory. So that's encoded into a long-term memory format, uh, really uh, focusing on the emotional content and, and the kind of facts and other elements that the brain can then reconstruct to give you a feeling of what that memory was. None of your memories are recorded exactly. And in fact, there's a lot of opportunity for error to, to show up because every time you remember something, it is reconstructive when it's retrieved from memory. And since it's not a complete memory at, the, at a time, your brain predicts, well, what would make sense? So things are added to it. And then that part is re-remembered. And then when you recall that, more error may be added into it. So our memory is amazing. It's almost unlimited. But don't ever think that it is completely accurate. Your brain reconstructs memory every single time it's recalled. Well, with this memory, you're thinking. And uh, there's a great, super popular book written by uh, two psychologists, Kahneman and, and Tversky, called Reading F or Thinking Fast and Slow. And uh, it, it highlights two sort of separate ways that we think all the time. Uh, most of our daily activities are governed by a fast emotion or, or sort of reflex driven thinking. That's, uh, we can think of that as fast thinking. Uh, and then if we have to th consider something, there's a slower, sort of more logical process. But don't mistake this slower system for being accurate. It's logical, yes, but what's logical for one person isn't for another. What's logical to you as a parent may not be logical to your middle school student or high school son or daughter. Uh, philosophers make a, a living out of thinking slowly with, through logic, but they all come up with different, different conclusions, right? So don't think that the slow thinking guarantees uh, accuracy. But just as an example, let's imagine that you meet somebody who you think, whoa, that's an interesting person. I want to get to know him or her a little better. Or you see a new, a new car and think, whoa, is that cool? I'd love that. Or you visit a friend's house and think, this is cool. I'd love to live here. But then imagine, he says, the house is for sale. Then the logical slow thinking comes in and you think, can I afford this? Do I want to move? Or this cool person you met, you think, okay, this person is cool, but do I want to live with this person? Isn't he or she sort of opinionated? I'd get sick of that, right? So your emotion attracts your focus and, and attention. And if, it's, if you have the time and importance, then your logical slow thinking kicks in. So this logical slow thinking is part of your consciousness, uh, cerebral cortex. That's actually what creates your experience of you, who you think you are. Your brain creates just a logical, cohesive narrative of your life, your life story. Part of it's fictional. It, it uh, weaves a thread among events of your life that it thinks are important, that define your life. And it exaggerates some, it ignores others. But it's a really supreme achievement where you and every other person who's ever lived builds a reality with their personal place in it. 
But keep in mind that it's your brain that creates this consistent story of you. And in fact, uh, recent research actually suggests that the primates and crows have some similar uh, kind of consciousness. That's a, a, a funny thing to think of. Uh, so just to, to reflect, our brains are related to the brains of other species that we're, ours aren't like 100% different from everybody else. Our human part is actually a fairly smart but powerful part of the whole. Uh, memory uh, it, that we experience during the day is encoded during sleep, during the REM phase of sleep to long-term memory. If you don't sleep well, you can't learn well. And what you experience in vision, what you see, and what you remember are created and then recreated by your brain. Don't assume that they are per completely accurate. Your brain creates yourself, your story of your life. But nearly all brain processes are unconscious in you and everyone. Lots to think about. We still have lots to learn about the brain.